Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Her lips suck forth my soul. See where it flies. So spoke Dr Faustus with some prescience shortly before being dragged off to hell in Christopher Marlowe's historical tragedy. His Faustian pact with the devil Mephistopheles had granted him 24 years of limitless knowledge and power, but at the cost of his soul. His terrible story was told as a dire warning to anyone who would seek to reach beyond the limits of their human lot. But who was the real Faust? Why has his story maintained a 500-year grip on the German and British imaginations? And how has his image changed as each generation embraced the myth? With me to discuss Faust are Juliet Wood, Associate Lecturer in the Department of Welsh at the University College of Wales in Cardiff and Secretary of the Folklore Society, Osman Durrani, Professor of German at the University of Kent at Canterbury and author of Faust, Icon of Modern Culture, and Rosemary Ashton, Quain Professor of English Language and Literature at University College London. Juliet Wood, the earliest stories about a magician of dubious reputation called Faust emerged at the very beginning of the 16th century in Germany. Can you tell us about that first reference and what it said? Well, the first reference is about 1507, and then there are sort of half a dozen to about 1540 when supposedly he died. And they're about a real person, or someone who's presented as real, called George Faust, rather than Johannes Faust. Um, and we're told that he's a trickster and a charlatan. Um, and we have this on a number of humanists who say this, who are clearly very disapproving of what he's, what he's doing. Um, but it's interesting that he's already becoming and attracting the kind of stories that magicians were, were centred in. And they are things that deal with tricks, tricking people and being a trickster. Um, and there's a story at which he sort of rides a, a wine barrel, and this is quite amazing, and one in which he um, causes, shows a, a priest how to shave his beard and has him burnt with arsenic. Um, and there are all these, all these sort of stories. So one gets a picture here of, a, of someone who's not so much a magician as a, as a trickster. It's a very negative picture. And then, of course, he dies, and it's a spectacular death. He knows the death is coming. He tells the innkeeper that, you know, don't, don't mind the noise. And the next day, the innkeeper goes up to Faust's room, and here is this body with the neck twisted round. And this is evidence that he'd made a pact with the devil and has died. And they try to undo his neck, as I read, five times and put it round. They, they do. They, it degrees, keeps twisting the back. It keeps twisting back. Mm. Uh, how uh, real the scholars? Uh, what's the possibility of there being a real Doctor Faustus or a real Faustus? What's what's the what's the state of? Uh, a state of play on that one. It's a very good possibility. In fact, I think uh, many of these magicians started out as real people, certainly in the sense that there's someone who, who represents a peg to hang the stories on. Um, so there probably was a Faustus um, who had studied magic or studied medicine. Uh, there were dozens of these scholars at the time. Because the, the references, the letters that come out, they come out from other scholars. It isn't as if the people, in the beginning, isn't it? They're, th those are the letters that, that, that we there have. Are. The first, there are about, there are about five, or six, references. five or six references from five or six different people. Um, and as I say, all to a George Faust, the earliest ones, which suggests that there is a real character there, even though the name changes later on. And, yeah, and the idea is that he's a scholar. The idea is that he's a trickster. Uh, the idea is that he's rather fraudulent. The idea that he's very boastful. Uh, all these things appear, in, and he's sort of drummed out of town in one in one of the letters. They say he's kicked out he, of Heidelberg. He is. Yeah. He is. Uh, they approach him and say, "You must. You must confess. You must repent." He says, "No, I won't." So they kick him out of town. Um, there is this idea of a kind of wandering scholar uh, of dubious reputation, and it's quite interesting that the people who are criticising him are themselves rather established scholars for the most part. Uh, who seem a bit uh, worried about this kind of, you know, new breed who are kind of getting in on the act and not really qualified. So it's coming out of the late uh, uh, 15th century into the early 16th century, <coughs> Osman Durrani, but, but much later in the 16th century, towards the end of it, in 1587, there's the first stories are brought together <coughs> in a chapbook. Why had he... <coughs> excuse <coughs> me. Why did he retain such popularity during that century, do you think? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to put in a, a robust defence of Dr Faustus. Uh, there are a couple of positive references to him, actually. There is a, a, a receipt uh, in the accounts of the Bishop of Bamberg, according to which the bishop paid uh, ten gulden for a horoscope, which Dr Faustus provided him with. So that suggests that a, a high-ranking church official was, was willing to pay out the equivalent of a year's manual wages for um, a document which this Dr. Faustus had, had produced. There is also a reference in Philip von Hutten's correspondence to a Dr. Faustus making a prediction about a journey that he went on to Venezuela and saying that uh, Faustus absolutely <laughs> hit the nail on the head when he said that uh, things were going to go badly wrong on this uh, expedition. I mean, I suppose no prizes for guessing that uh, this was going to be a risky venture. The chapbook was put together in the late 16th century. We don't know by whom. It's based on a number of short stories which were beginning to Can appear. Can you just tell us what a chapbook is? A, a, a chapbook is, well, an early form of the novel. It's a, a book which contains a, a storyline, but also a lot of different materials, such as um, useful advice on practical matters and... Uh, also some sermonizing. So it's a, a, a novel consisting not just of the story of, of the life of this magician, but um, other elements as well. For example, some people come up to Faustus and ask him about the origin of thunder, and uh, he gives them a long lecture as to how thunder occurs, and it's, uh, it's all to do with the four winds clashing together and then banging against the crystal spheres that hold the sun and moon in place. So um, on, on the basis of what was known at the time, uh, Faustus provides useful information. Can I come back to my original question, though? Why, what do you think had sustained his popularity in the eight years between the first reference in, in the letter in 1507 and the publication of this chapbook? Well, think about it as something absolutely horrendous. A, a man uh, concludes a pact with a devil. It's like the, the equivalent of a, a sighting of aliens or an alien abduction. People were fascinated at the time by non-terrestrial beings of a, a heavenly or diabolical nature. After all, Martin Luther had prepared them for this. Martin Luther himself believed personally in the physical existence of the devil, so much so that he once threw an ink pot at him in Wartburg Castle. Uh, you can still, still see the spot where this happened. And people wanted to know more about the devil. There aren't all that many references to the devil in the Bible. There are just a few. And so these had to be filled in, coloured in, fleshed in, and in the late uh, 16th century, there was a plethora of Faust, of, of devil books uh, involving devils, all of whom had a particular brief. They might incite people to, to drink heavily. They might incite people to waste their money on expensive clothing. They might cause people to commit adultery. And the chapbook about Dr. Faustus and the devil focuses on a very particular kind of devil, an academic devil. He homes in on the man of learning and tempts him to go further and further and extend the frontiers of knowledge into forbidden areas, and that's where Faustus then gets his comeuppance. And, and this was a fascinating subject for 16th century readers. Rosemary Ashton, there was all that, as it were, let's call it high-minded uh, side of Faust, but there was Surely one of the things that kept you going was a very low life part of Faust too, wasn't it? Going into inns, um, tricking the landlord to get free drink, uh, yes. being a charlatan. Uh, yes. That must have appealed. Absolutely. Spectacle, and particularly quite a lot of <coughs> low life spectacle, as you say. And a lot of theatre, as far as I understand it, in the 16th century, is moving. It's travelling troops going from town to town. And in particular, um, uh, we know that in the later 16th century, a lot of English dramatic troops uh, went round Germany, took plays round Germany and so on. So there was an interaction between certainly England and Germany in terms of uh, acting. And yes, Yes, a spectacle. You could have low life in there, but you would have it always bounded, by, uh, bracketed, as it were, by the moral lesson that was to be learnt from what happened to Faust as a result of his bargain with the devil. Did Faust work his way into morality plays at the time? Well, I think it's more that morality plays which were on the wane after the Reformation because the Re Protestants didn't like the idea of too much in the way of um, religious icons and the Bible being brought onto the stage. It's more that morality plays were on the decline and you might say that Faust fitted in as a rather more secular um, figure to um, carry on drama 
but it has uh, undoubtedly the Faust legend and Faust dramas do have in the 16th century something of the morality play about them. So by the end of the 16th century, uh, Osmond Durrani, we have a fairly complicated character in the chapbook who can go in many different directions. And remarkably soon, just two or three years after the chapbook came out, Christopher Marlowe uh, brings forward the first massive work of uh, literature, uh, The uh, Tragical History of Dr Faustus. Can you tell us how he got hold of the subject and what he did with it? Well, so much is shrouded in doubt concerning Christopher Marlowe's life that uh, I'm not going to be able to unravel this. Um, to, to go back very briefly to the morality plays, what is extremely interesting about the story of Dr Faustus is that it stands the morality play on its head. In, in miracle plays and morality plays, you have uh, quite often a character who uh, is tempted by the devil, who gives in to the devil, who enjoys the benefits of a kind of pact, but who then repents and says, terribly sorry, I didn't really mean to be wicked, and, and recognises that uh, the love of God is there to help him, to save him. And what is different about Dr Faustus is that this, this love is no longer there or is no longer able to help somebody who has signed a, a pact in his own blood. Marlowe is fascinated by the story, and being uh, of academic bent himself takes the story further into the world of academic learning, takes uh, Faustus claims to be an academic which are really not built up on very much in the chapbook um, and, and gives us demonstrations of his wisdom. There are passages in Latin, etc. And uh, has a, a kind of, towards the end, a kind of grudging admiration for Faustus comes through. Uh, Faustus is blind, but he is also tragic. And he is tragic for one particular reason, and that is that he knows what he has done. He knows the day when he will die. He knows the very moment when he will die. And in that final scene, we have him awaiting the arrival of the devil. And we cannot but feel compassion for him. And so Marlowe takes the first few steps in the direction of turning the villain into a hero. I, th I think that's right. He, he does actually begin to give Faust to psychology rather than just a sort of narrative. Um, there's a very interesting uh, point at which um, when Mephistopheles is saying, come on, come on, make the pact, um, Faust gets very excited at the whole idea, of course, of getting out of the study where he's been disappointed and not managed to learn enough for all his uh, hard work. And um, Faust says, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to make this pact. And he says, but, you know, where do you come from? And, and Mephistopheles says, well, I'm like Lucifer. Um, I fell from heaven and uh, I, I was sent to hell. And Faust says, but you're not in hell now, you're here. And Mephistopheles says, but this is hell, nor am I out of it. Uh, so he tells Faust... Faustus, that, you know, hell is what awaits. But Faustus has got the bit between his teeth now. He wants to transgress, and Faustus uh, turns round and says, they, they reverse roles and says, oh, no, no, Mephistopheles, you mustn't be such a wimp. Um, you know, courage, let's go onwards. And that seems to me to be quite a psychologically interesting moment, which I don't think you get in the earlier stories. No, you, you don't. I mean, they're, they're very popular stories. Um, but there is, I think Marlowe is developing things that are at least there coded in the structure in that many of these stories challenge authority. Uh, Faust challenges authority. He challenges it in a very bawdy way. Uh, all of the drinking, um, all of the getting one over on authority, the monks and the and and the innkeepers and things like that. But, of course, this literature was very popular and very widespread, um, and I think the people liked it. This was a time of great social change. And certainly you have what we see in Faust, which is the intellectual um, and the psychological thing. But I think also there was a social um, facet to this, and you get this in the puppet plays about Faust, which were popular theatre, um, and certainly not the same quality as Marlowe in terms of subtlety. Uh, but they had the same impact, and of course they would have an impact on a very, very broad sense. So while Faust dies at the end, you get this nice, comfortable morality well, you know, everything is safe. In between, he is a real challenge to authority figure, and I think that had a resonance. I think that did have a resonance. Osman, can you give us some more meat about the Marlowe play for those <coughs> who might not be very familiar with it? Well, the first thing to note is that uh, we're dealing with an extremely unstable text. 
there are two versions of the Marlowe play. I mean, we refer to it as the Marlowe play, but there's, there's a text dating from 1604 and there's a very different text dating from 1616. And we are not certain as to which parts were written by Marlowe and which were not. One eminent critic described Marlowe's Dr Faustus as a cathedral hit by a bomb. We can see the outlines, we can see a, a ruined structure... So we do not really know what Marlowe uh, intended. But so after, the, after the Marlowe play, as it were, looking at it in, in this rather straightforward sweep, the puppet theatre keeps it going, and the next great figure to get hold of it is Goethe, uh, back in Germany, of course, in the 18th century, who spent over 60 years writing versions. Can you tell us what attraction it had for Goethe and why he was so... Well, I think 60 years on one subject could be called obsessed by it. Well, we have to take a look at what was happening in Germany in the 18th century. <clears throat> Germany was in a very different position from most other countries <coughs> in Europe. Uh, Germany did not have a national culture to look back to in the way that England, France, Italy, Spain and other countries did. You know, even Portugal had its Camões, uh, Spain had its Golden Age, the Elizabethans in England. There wasn't very much there in Germany. And in the 18th century, when um, <clears throat> young people started being educated in large numbers, remember that in the mid-18th century, Germany had 27 universities when England only had two, and, and people were beginning to take a lively interest in their own culture, they looked back a few hundred years, and they found very little there. They found religious debates in the, in the wake of Luther's Reformation. They found some medieval epics, though many of those turned out to be translations from the French. So they wanted to, they wanted to be able to prove that German culture was as great as that of other countries. And so they hit on an idea which is really quite remarkable, and that is to look at to look in a different place, to look at folk literature, to look at folk songs, to look at fairy tales. And that is how Faustus was rediscovered, because Goethe was at the forefront of this campaign to put Germany on the map. Why did he devote 60 years of... That's, very, that's a very, sound, a very uh, comprehensive and helpful summary, but why did he spend 60 years on it? Well, one of the reasons is because Goethe's own attitudes changed. Goethe moved from being a, a kind of German chauvinist in the 1770s to being an, an internationalist later on. And so he abandoned his Faust. Then his publisher came along around about 1790 and said, look, we know that you've been working on Faust for so many years. We know that you've got a manuscript there. It was in a very loose and confused form in his Faust sack or Faust pouch. Get these um, fragments out and put together a play and we'll publish it. And Goethe did this in 1790. But it was a fragment. It ends halfway through part one. It ends with the cathedral scene. And he was reluctant to continue with it. And one reason why he was reluctant was that he found it very difficult to think of a way of introducing the devil. After all, Goethe himself didn't believe in the devil and many enlightened people in the 18th century didn't. So how could you put the devil on stage? So this became the great gap in the text and, and Goethe partly agonised about this but also put it on the back burner. And it wasn't until he formed his friendship with Schiller and, and in the early years of the 19th century was persuaded by Schiller to, you know, get on with it and, and, and conclude this play that everybody's waiting for, that he actually, it was after Schiller's death in, in 1805, he started uh, working on a final version of Part One, and that came out in 1808. Juliet Wood, uh, in Mahler's Faust, uh, Faust is dragged off to hell, but in Goethe's Faust he makes it to heaven. Uh, qu quite a difference. It is uh, quite a, it can is quite you a just tell us one or two of the other differences? What is who is Go we, we've got some idea of Marlowe's Faust. Yeah. We've some idea of the chapbook Faust. So we've got a 16th century idea. Now, what about Goethe's Faust? Well, Goethe's, What's he like? Goethe's Faust has moved more into an Enlightenment world, where questioning your limitations was not only all right, uh, but what actually was something one was supposed to do. Um, knowledge is very is very very important although there's a conflict in Goethe's Faust between knowledge and experience. This, this chaotic experience Goethe has a little, a, a little bit of problems with. But certainly we're moving into a romantic age as well. 
Um, and the whole concept of Faust was beginning to change. I mean, by the time Goethe's Faust comes out, um, you have other kind of Faustian figures. This kind of cons- concept of a Faustian hero is beginning to spread outward. So Goethe is pulling on um, a sense of Faust, which comes originally from folklore, but also a sense of man's nature, which actually comes from philosophy and culture, and that being Enlightenment, early 19th century philosophy and culture. Can we develop that, or take that on just a little, please, Rosemary? Mm-hmm. I mean, you could say, broadly speaking, that from what w- the little we know about Marlowe, Marlowe's Faust mm-hmm. m- might look quite a bit like Marlowe as well as like Faust. And how much does Goethe's Faust look like Goethe? Well, uh, quite a lot, I think, uh, as Osmond would have been suggesting, um, because uh, Goethe always said that he did feel like Faust, that he was a he was, was a learned man. I mean, he wrote uh, scientific treaty, treaties, he wrote about art, he was he was he wrote in every genre. So uh, Goethe was aiming to be a kind of universal man a universal learned person. Uh, But he too had his disappointment and uh, dissatisfactions with his own uh, life and his own knowledge and so on. And he actually said more than once that um, he felt exactly what Faust had, had felt uh, about uh, in, in terms of dissatisfaction, the, the human condition, really. And I think that's where we have moved into the Romantic period, where uh, it isn't wrong to strive, where we've got theories, both in England and Germany, and here you have a consonance, I think, between the two countries. You have theories of the imagination where the writer is a creator. The writer is a kind of user, is usurping God in, uh, by creating through this uh, uh, faculty of the imagination, by going beyond the bounds of experience. Um, this whole notion that the writer is a, is a creator, but of course takes risks. And Goethe was preeminently a writer, and he wanted to take risks. And I think he felt, although Faust isn't in, in his play uh, an artist, I think he felt that kind of affinity with Faust's overreaching, uh, if you like. But he does set the uh, intellectual overreaching against uh, the immorality that Faust uh, indulges in. Those are, those are two separate things, I think. And you've alluded to the fact that, 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 the, the, uh, that Goethe's version spread out, as it were. Um, uh, Osman alluded to it beforehand. He became into nationalist second version. He's becoming an individual, isn't he? He's become an oppositional individual. He is, and he's definitely. reflecting the time. And he's taking on signs, as it were, as well. Well, mm. well, we know that the magicians had, uh, were, were getting towards signs in their own way, and Goethe himself was a scientist, and, and so on and so forth. It even, it, uh, it's entering into things like the Frankenstein pact. Mm. It, so it, so it, so it, so it, it is. Can you develop that um, a little bit? Uh, well, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley certainly was admired Goethe. Um, and her Frankenstein, her Dr. Frankenstein, creates uh, a monster. Now, interestingly, in a sense, um, Mephistopheles and Faust get sort of squashed together in that Mephistopheles is an aspect of the mind of the scientist. You don't have a deliberate temptation. In a sense, it's all happening inside Dr. Frankenstein. But he goes beyond the, the realms of knowledge into science, whereas the other Fausts were looking for different kinds of power, sometimes youth or, or whatever. And, of course, he creates this monster and finds he can't control it. Um, And it's not that he's condemned to hell, but everything he loves is destroyed. So it pushes Faust into a different different area, much the same area that E.T.A. Hoffman did as well with Coppelius, although Dr. Coppelius is less well well known. But this idea of of magic shading into science and of Mephistopheles becoming an aspect of Faust's psyche rather than an external tempter... Another very important element, I think, that uh, we can trace back to Goethe is the notion of the two souls. Mm-hmm. There's a point in Goethe's Faust where, where Faust speaks of himself as a man with two souls torn in different directions, one soul flying up to heaven, the other pulled down to the earth, down into the dust, into the gutter. And we see this then in, in many 19th century stories. Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde would be a good example of the polarity of the human spirit, and and this is something that I think Goethe bequeathed to European culture and which is taken up then in the 19th century all the way down to um, Oscar Wilde's uh, picture of Dorian Gray. Well, Oscar Wilde uses that phrase, doesn't he? Mm. uh, Something like, I'll give my soul for that. I mean, he just comes straight straight in with that, doesn't Mm. it? And that is the Faustian pact he made. That is the the Faustian pact, but again... Um, there's sort to of be forever no, young, that is. To be forever to youth, yeah. yes, which, which in fact the original Faust asked for. It, it takes us back again to but the it, original yeah. story. But again, there's no um, external tempter. Dorian, yes, looks at the cat, and this is, this is supposedly where he's making the bargain with some sort of Egyptian monstrosity. Um, but there's no one who, who says to Dorian, uh, you know, 
what do you want? It's kind of Dorian works this out for himself. He says, what I really want is to be young. And then suddenly he finds he's got it, and it's, it's terrible. So we've had Faust as a trickster and as a lowlife. We've had him as a scholar, and he's been a theologian and so on, as, as, as I was mentioning in the chapbooks, he, he gives his views. He's ter- he, then he begins to be used as the artist. He is an artist. Uh, he represents, he can be used as the, the modern artist struggling and so on. And Thomas Mann's Tom, uh, is, massive is novel Thomas, is the biggest Mann. testament yes, to that. So yeah. can you... Uh, well, very difficult to briefly summarise that very it, long it and complicated <laughs> novel, but there you go. Um, Mann has <coughs> the artist make a bargain... Uh, to create art at all costs. Now, man was very attracted to this. This is the romantic idea that if you are an artist, whatever you have to pay for it, that is, that is fine. But man also has the artist deteriorate. Um, man's musician deteriorates as a person as he becomes better known as an artist. And man does this in two ways. One, by allowing him to be diseased. He gets venereal disease. This brings the woman, the woman into it. But man also spins it into politics as well, because man is writing in 1950, and he's talking about how Germany has bankrupted itself by going back to this world of primitive dissonance instead of the order. By making a pact with the devil. By making a pact with the devil. And so instead of the order that you have in Goethe's world and in Beethoven's music, you have sort of disorder and and dissonance. And of course, Mann was interested in the theories of Schoenberg. I mean, you know, Mann's novel is is immensely complex. But this political spin, um, again, I think is always there because of this this challenge to authority. But you get it very, very strongly in the 20th century. Yes, I think what is extremely important Mm -hmm. is that uh, the image of Faustus had become more and more positive in the course of the 19th century. In the 20th century, he was uh, almost universally portrayed as somebody who was extending human knowledge, who was brave, who was daring to do things that other people did not dare to do. And so he was a ready-made icon for the National Socialists. Mm -hmm. And what Mann does is he takes this up and he shows the reality. He shows a man Mm -hmm. who is sick, a man who is misguided, a man who destroys himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got it earlier in F.W. Murnau's film as well, uh, which wasn't very popular in Germany. Indeed, um, Murnau left Germany. It was the mid-20s, where you get Faust becoming disenchanted with knowledge because the devil is a plague and Faust can't cure people and he rejects knowledge. But again, there's also this sense of the the plague is is political as well as, as medicinal. So in the, in the 20th century, we get Faust as part of the Nazi myth and then uh, man trying to uh, reclaim Faust and yet going through that experience in the, in the writing of the book. And we come back to our beginning because the Faust that uh, Thomas Mann creates is based entirely on the chapbook and not on Goethe. For, uh, Mann ignores Goethe and takes all the analogies from the, from the chapbook. In fact, Adrian Leverkuhn, the central character of Dr. Faustus, um, imagines that he is a modern Faustus to the extent of imitating the language of the chapbook and imitating this old-fashioned German, which becomes his personal house style. Rosary. Yes, I mean, I think that's, that's very interesting. I wonder if Nietzsche just ought to be mentioned briefly here too as part of the sort of perversion, uh, the, the process of perversion of the Faustus figure, the Übermensch, the Superman, um, the anti-Christian in particular, Nietzsche, who thought that Christianity with its humility and, and so on was all wrong and that, in fact, striving beyond good and evil um, was what you had to do. And unfortunately, that then feeds into Nazism as well, um, whereas Thomas Mann is more concerned with culture. Well, quite a journey from a letter in 1507 talking about this trickster at inns and this uh, wandering, vagrant, vagrant charlatan scholar. But thank you very much for that. Next week, I'll be discussing the Roman Republic. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.